This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Entrepreneur, media personality, and mayor of Miami Beach, Philip Levine, on this edition of Conversations. Philip Levine is an accomplished businessman who is serving his second term as mayor of Miami Beach, Florida. Speculation is that he has aspirations to be on a bigger political stage and will run for governor of Florida in 2018. Levine's credentials make him a formidable challenger. He has business and political experience, along with the media savvy needed to be a challenger for the Sunshine State's top job. In addition to being mayor of Miami Beach, Levine is the CEO of Royal Media Partners and is host of a national radio show on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. We welcome Mayor Philip Levine to Conversations. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeff. Let me begin. Speculation is you might run for governor. Why in the world would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, first of all, I'm thinking about it. I'm going to make a decision in October. I'll make an announcement. Uh, I love our state, and I think it's important that more people that uh, come from the private sector, that have done something outside of government, Come in and, and, and really give back to your state. I did it with my city of Miami Beach. It's been the most rewarding, amazing experience of my life. And, uh, and hopefully, possibly, I'm considering doing something on a statewide basis. Let's, let's talk about that. You were very successful in business. I want to talk more about that in just a couple of moments. But why did you decide to get into politics to begin with? Well, I, I started with $500, Jeff, and uh, took a job on a cruise ship. And I was very fortunate to build these fantastic companies in the cruise ship industry. Uh, and then I, uh, I got involved in politics on a local level. Uh, wanted to see things change, uh, struck up a friendship with uh, former President Clinton. I saw some of the great things he had done, and I thought, you know what, I, I want to give back. I want to do something great. And I, and I watched what was going on in my own town. It was like, it was the epitome of analysis paralysis, where you had these people in office that couldn't get anything done. And meanwhile, you know, our streets were flooding, and no one had any ideas or any solutions. So I said, I'm going to run. I'm going to run for mayor. And of course, when you decide to run for office, it's the most incredible thing. You know, half your friends are like, you know, go, go. It's like, you know, jump out of that foxhole. <laughs> <laughs> and your other half of your friends are like, you need to see a psychiatrist. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I ran a very unconventional campaign, and everyone thought I no way I could win. And I won on a landslide twice. So uh, that's how I did it. I read that you what, knocked on like 6,000 doors yeah. or something crazy like that. Yeah. Is that right? It was great. I tell you, it's a great way to lose weight. And uh, I walked and knocked. I, I always laugh, and I, I, you know, Miami Beach has a lot of big, tall condominium right. buildings. Right. So uh, I literally had to evade all the security to get in. And I said I became like the, uh, the, the, the best cat burglar possible because I got into these buildings, and I knocked on the doors. And I, I always say, like, I wanted to talk to the customers. Right. Uh, a lot of people call them residents. I was calling them customers. Right. They're the one paying taxes. I want to hear what they had to say. And I knocked on 6,000 doors. I qualified to be uh, a mayor on the ballot by petition. And uh, it was funny. I was wearing my Nike sneakers and uh, you know, the Nike Air Max. Right. I, I never heard of anyone blowing out a Nike Air Max. I would be blew them out. I had a flat tire on my sneaker because <laughs> I had walked so much. But it was fun. It was a great way to kind of meet the people and listen to them. What did you learn most from, from doing that? Well, the first thing I learned for sure is that people really appreciate one-on-one -on -one contact. They really do obviously want to be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I learned a lot about what was going on in my city that, you know, I thought that I knew. I didn't necessarily know. Uh, and the customers told me what was important. Um, I, and I think that's a, that's a really big, important point. Uh, you know, being an entrepreneur, um, uh, coming from the private sector, uh, you always listen to your customers. I right. think sometimes in politics, uh, some of the elected leaders aren't listening to their people. Right. And uh, those are the folks that are, are literally uh, paying the bills. Right. Once you got into office, what was it like for you? It was fantastic, and it still is. And, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, isn't business different than politics and government? Doesn't it run different? And I said, no, not at all. I said, you know, people in government or in private sector work for two things. Number one, compensation, mm -hmm. and number two, they work for purpose. I found in the government that I entered, they had great compensation, they just didn't have purpose. They didn't have leadership. And I found that, you know, speed of the leader determines the rate of the pack. And I don't care if that's government or that's private sector. And I, and I think what, what, what people needed was leadership in our city. Uh, but I found that uh, when you provide that leadership and you get people excited and you say, this is where we're going to go. And it's okay to make mistakes. Let's have fun. Let's move forward. Uh, they rallied. We have a great government in Miami Beach and we have a great resident group 
uh, and, and we kind of came together because we're fighting the sea level rise stuff, as you can imagine, which is pretty tough. Talk to me more about the sea level rise that you're dealing with and the flooding that Miami Beach has experienced. You know, I ran for mayor. Uh, uh, our streets were filling up with water, you know, 40, 50 days a year when it's a sunny day because of the king tide. Uh, because of sea level rise, the, the tide's just rising, and it was reversing course and coming up in our streets through our gutters. Uh, and I said, if I'm elected mayor, uh, I'm going to attack the problem. Now, I don't have all the answers because no one does. But, you know, there's nothing 100 percent effective, but doing nothing is 100 percent ineffective. And I won't stand by and do nothing. Uh, matter of fact, it's kind of funny. I, I ran a TV commercial, which was cool. I, I showed me paddling down the street in Miami Beach. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm wearing a yellow slicker, and I said, uh, some people want to be the mayor of Venice. I said, I want to be the mayor of Miami Beach, and I think these streets need to be dry. And I had my boxer dog, Earl, next to me, and the water's pouring on his head. And, uh, and I turned to him, and I said, paddle, Earl, paddle. And he looked at me and cried at the exact moment, and that went viral. And, uh, of course, my dog, Earl, thinks he got me elected. That's not really the case. And, uh, and we, of course, have attacked it. We've raised roads. We're putting in pumps. We're changing our building codes. We're raising the seawalls. Thank God Miami Beach uh, uh, is enough economic success that we're able to pay that. We haven't gotten any help from the state or the federal government. And we've made some great progress. But it's one of those things you, you never can win against Mother Nature. It's an ongoing battle. Uh, I was featured in a documentary with Leonardo DiCaprio called Before the Flood, mm -hmm. which is on iTunes. I played the mayor of Miami Beach in that, uh, in that documentary, and we told the world what's going on. Yeah. And what is going on? But what's going on is the tide is rising. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate. I always laugh and say, you know, a mayor's, we don't debate uh, these type of things. We, we have to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. So the tide is rising. And the tide is rising, I believe, because of climate change, uh, which is to a large extent being brought on by some of the things that humankind is doing with fossil fuels. And, and uh, with the carbon emission into the environment, it's heated up the planet. And, and I always say, you know, if, if, if you don't believe that the sea is going up, come on down to Miami Beach during one of our king tides. I'll take you out to one of the roads we haven't, you know, raised yet, and we'll convert you. Mm -hmm. You'll see the water rising. So that's what's going on. And plus these unexpected severe weather uh, events, these called, they call them rain bombs, where it rains so severely, like unlike anything we've ever seen before. And we need to fix it. We need to make sure that our cities are resilient. And uh, there's more cities out there uh, like Miami Beach that are having the same issue. Why do you think that the climate change discussion has become so political? It's unfortunate, and it's a shame, and I think that uh, uh, it's become political like everything's become political. Uh, one of the things I've always said, Jeff, is uh, the ocean, it's not Republican and it's not Democrat. It just knows how to rise, and that's what it's doing. But we know that there's special interests, uh, which basically is saying that uh, we want to continue in the fossil fuel industry and don't tell us uh, that we're uh, causing this. And I understand where they're coming from. But, but when the world's scientists are telling you this is what's going on, uh, it, it may be a good idea to listen to them. And it's a shame that the way our political system is set up, and listen, we know what it is. Uh, you take all this money from fossil fuel, you're going to say that it is a man, it's a hoax, it's a Chinese hoax. If you're not taking the money and you believe in the scientists, you're not going to say that. And I think it's unfortunate because our system is gridlocked this way and we shouldn't be. Uh, you know, I, I'm a Democrat and, uh, and uh, uh, I laugh and I said, listen, uh, before I'm a Democrat, I'm an American and, and I'm not right and I'm not left. I'm forward. I just want to get things done. And, and I think it's important now that we all realize that we need to come together, like our grandparents did in World War II. We came together. We didn't debate Normandy all day long. We're going to land. We're not going to land. We should land. We couldn't land. We did it. And we need to get that spirit back in our country of getting things done. Do you think that the Republicans and Democrats are getting a little bit closer to seeing kind of eye to eye on, on climate change? Because here's, here, here's what is good. There are a lot of people who will say, Yes, things are changing, but it's just the natural cycle. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who will say what you're saying, fossil fuels are causing it. I guess when the day is done, it doesn't really matter what's causing it. If something is happening, it probably needs to fix. Do you, do you feel like things, the, the, the two parties are maybe starting to come a little closer? Oh, I think so. You know what I think is leading it also? Uh, the most admired organizations in the world today, it's not governments, local or state or federal. It's some of the great companies in America, whether it's GE or Lockheed or Apple or Amazon or, or all these amazing companies that we're seeing. And these companies are coming out and saying, uh, we believe that the climate's changing and we believe it's happening for this reason. 
uh, and they don't really care what the government's saying because they're not going to get affected. They're going to they're going to do what they feel is right, and they're listening to their customers. And as that movement continues, and as the young generation, which is coming up and taking power, is saying, "Hey." Don't leave us this planet that's overheated. Uh, we, we want change. Uh, the political leaders have to listen because the power of your vote is so important. Right. You mentioned you were a Democrat, but I've also, I've also noticed that you've been quoted as calling yourself a radical centrist. Yeah. What is that? Well, I think it's an important thing, and I, uh, I came up with that term uh, months and months ago because I realized, you know, I, I believe in the center. I believe that we need to come together. I believe that uh, uh, it, it's not about right or left. It's not about, uh, no one has a monopoly on good ideas. Uh, there are a lot of Republican ideas that are great ideas and Democrat ideas. But more importantly, they're American ideas. And, and it's about time for us to come together. Uh, I, and I, I listen, I've got a lot of great progressive credentials, so to speak. Uh, but, but so does Apple. <laughs> and so does GE, and so does Tesla, and so do all these great companies around the world. And, and, I, and I believe that the, the parties have gotten in the way, to some extent, of moving the country forward. And, and I think that it's really person, not party. People vote for a person. They believe in a person. I'm not sure they necessarily believe in a party. And, and I believe that you're, you're seeing it and you're feeling it, uh, that we need to come together as Americans. Why do you think that has occurred with the parties? It, 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 they're very, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, it's very much a us against them right now, maybe more so than ever. Why is yeah, that? I think it's two reasons. Number one, uh, I believe the amount of campaign cash that's been allowed to get into these campaigns is obsessive. It's horrible. Uh, when you allow unlimited donations um, to from corporations and wealthy individuals uh, to such an extent, uh, this is causing, you know, a, a shift to both ways. And I think in combination with gerrymandering, the fact that, you know, you're carving out these districts in such a way that that's a Republican district and that's a Democratic district, we can't live this way. Our grandparents would be embarrassed. Our great-grandparents would cry. Uh, this is not who we are. We need to come together. But those two factors, I believe, has caused such a unfortunate situation in our political system, and you see the grid lick in Washington. Mm -hmm. But you know who's leading the way in our country? Mayors. Mayors are getting things done. And Mayor Bloomberg said something that I've always listened, I never forgot it. He said, when you're a mayor, there's no Republican or Democratic way to pick up trash. And that says a lot. And I think mayors are the future leaders in our country, because they're on the ground, they're listening to the people, they're closest to the customer, and they know that the customer wants to get things done. Interesting you bring up Mayor Bloomberg. Some, perhaps some similarities between the two of you, both of you successful in business and then moved into politics. I read where you happen to be a big fan of his. What is it you like about Michael Bloomberg? Well, I think uh, Mayor Bloomberg um, uh, went into office for all the right reasons. Uh, he certainly didn't want to enrich himself. Uh, he certainly wasn't looking for fame. Uh, he did it because he said, if not me, then who? Uh, I've got great experience. I can get things done. Uh, I I'm, think I'm pure of spirit. Uh, and I can help move the country forward, and that's what he did in New York City. Uh, and, I, and I think, to me, that's what we need in future leadership. I always laugh and say uh, uh, what, what America is looking for in their leaders is they want them to have this crazy, weird thing in their background. Absolutely nuts. It's called a job. Right. <laughs> and they don't care if you were a busboy or a bartender. <laughs> they don't care if you were a teacher or a technician. They just want to know that you have worked. Yeah. And I'm one of those people that actually believes that government is a worse background for government. Mm -hmm. I think you need to have done something else in your life. How can you give back if you've never done anything? How can you share your knowledge if your knowledge is only from one area, from government? And I believe we're seeing it more and more. And I encourage people that are out there that don't come from government to go into government, run for office. And I think Mayor Bloomberg is a model for a lot of us. I was going to say, it seems to me like there are an awful lot of people, both in Tallahassee, Washington, and, 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 and elsewhere around the nation who have done nothing but be in government most mm -hmm. of their life, elected office. Yeah. So how do you get a real perspective if you're in that situation? I agree with you. And I think that's the problem we're having right now. And I think that, um, uh, you know, remember our founding fathers, uh, you know, they weren't like our founding politicians. Right. They were farmers and doctors and lawyers and business people, the folks that signed that Declaration of Independence. I don't think there was a lot of career politicians there. Right. Right. It wasn't supposed to be a career. Right. It was supposed to be your time as a citizen to give back to your country or your state or your city. We've lost that. It's time for the people 
to realize that the government has to serve the people, and it's, it's not a, it shouldn't be your lifetime career, and you certainly shouldn't enrich yourself after it. Yeah. How, how, how do you stop that? Now, obviously, there are term limits in the state of Florida, but what about Washington? Should there well, be term I, I, limits? I, I think there should be term limits, absolutely, 100%. But I think there's a lot of things we can do. But I, I think what's happening now, and you're seeing it, is a lot of private sector people who, and by the way, you don't have to be in business. I don't care what, you could have been a valet for 20 years. You learned something as a valet. And I think a lot of people are, are, are hearing it, feeling it, and that's why you're seeing people get into the political process. I think it's happening naturally out of frustration. Were you surprised Donald Trump was elected? No. No, it wasn't at all. Matter of fact, I was incredibly active in Secretary Clinton's campaign. I was on the ground constantly, and, uh, and I listened. I was hearing. And the one thing that I always felt and learned is that you don't win an election because they don't like the other guy. You win an election because they like you, you inspire them, and they come out to vote for you. And unfortunately, it didn't happen in Secretary Clinton's campaign. She's bright, she's brilliant, she's good, but she wasn't able to inspire, and it's a shame. Uh, and I think that people uh, felt misgivings to both candidates, but Donald Trump represented change and a lot of frustration out there. And if we don't listen to why he was elected, then we'll make the same mistake many, many times going forward. Uh, everybody needs to be part of the solution. There can't be winners and losers. Everyone needs to win. You say you're a Democrat, but you're very successful in business. Some of your ideas might very well, particularly in business, be considered moderate, maybe even conservative. Why are you a Democrat? I'm a Democrat because I think that the greatest companies in our country and in the world have principles where they're pro-people and they're pro-business. I'm pro-people and pro-business. I know that if you take care of people, they'll deliver for you. If you raise a minimum living wage, if you make sure people have health care, if you offer education opportunities for folks that can't afford it, if you become part of Team Florida, if you, if you mirror these great organizations and you look at their HR manuals and how they take care of their people, they will come. It's almost like Field of Dreams. Build it and they shall come. The issue with Florida is how do we get these great companies to come to Florida so that our millennials don't graduate college and leave? And we do it through education, through the right health care, through the right infrastructure investments. You know, I always say, you know, a bridge and a tunnel and a new street. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. I've never heard anyone go on a new bridge and say, I don't like that bridge. That's a Republican bridge. It doesn't work that way. It creates jobs. And so I think we need to start thinking like some of these great organizations and model ourselves after it. And like they say, like attracts like. So uh, I'm a Democrat, but I'm pro-business and I'm pro-people. The likelihood is, if you decide to run, and if you were elected as governor, the likelihood's probably pretty good that you'll be working with a Republican legislature. How would you approach that? I, I think that I would approach it in the way that I've always approached everything. Personal relationships are important, and having a common goal of doing the right thing for the people and getting things done. And if you have a legislature that wants to get things done, and a legislature that understands and compromise and realizes that, you know, if we are pro-business and pro-people and we have the same goals, uh, I believe you can get people to do what you need them to do and vice versa. And I think it's like in life, you, you, you're not going to get everything you want, uh, but you get what you need. Yeah. And I think it's all about the art of compromise. Isn't that politics? That's politics. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about you personally here for just a second. You sure. said you started out with $500, started yes. your own company with $500. Tell me the story. Well, I, I, I tried a few different jobs when I was a kid and I had delusions of grandeur, as my mom used to say. And uh, I answered an ad in the paper and Royal Caribbean wanted a lecturer. I said, oh, I'd love to be a lecturer on Royal Caribbean, and they hired me. Thank God they didn't do any due diligence, because they asked me if I had great public speaking experience. I said, yes, I'm great, but meanwhile, I'd never done it. Took a job on a cruise ship uh, and uh, gave this lectures. was terrified, thought it was the dumbest decision I ever made in my life, thought I committed career suicide at like 22, 23. And uh, next thing you know, I fell into an industry that was growing and exciting, and I loved it. And I started a company, and I ended up owning the majority of businesses on board cruise ships all over the world, selling it to Louis Vuitton. and. Uh, it started from nothing, and, and, I, and it was my dream. It was my vision. I loved it, and I loved the cruise ship industry. And, yeah. uh, and I think the American dream is different for everybody. Yeah. Tell, me, tell me the story. How did you go from working for the cruise ship to owning a business that sold to the cruise ship industry? Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I literally made that decision to get off the cruise ship, and I took a little office above the news cafe on Ocean Drive in Miami Beach as that was going through its own renaissance, 
and uh, went and got that first contract. I, I literally, you know, persistence breaks resistance, and I had that one cruise line to finally say, okay, we'll give you a shot, and I had a, a typewriter, <laughs> an assistant, and, and that's how we began. And, you know, it's like anything else. You, you start small. And if you have a good idea and you work hard, it grows. And I happen to be in a great industry. You know, I always say catch a wave. Right. I caught the cruise ship industry wave. Right. But there's waves everywhere. Right. And the industry of the cruise industry has continued to grow. And it's the most, it's one of our amazing homegrown industries in right. Florida. Right. What advice would you give an entrepreneur? What would you give, what advice would you give a budding entrepreneur? My advice would be follow your instinct, follow your heart, never give up, keep trying. Um, it's the old story of the stone cutter. You know, big guys hitting a stone, big boulder. 99 times there's this little boy watching. On the 100th time, the guy hits it, it splits open, and the little boy says, boy, you hit it hard on the 100th time. And the stone cutter says, no, no, no. It was the 99 times before that did it. So keep pushing, keep moving forward, and do what you love. Do what you love. Don't do it because it's going to make you money. Do what you love, and then money will come. Talk about resilience. Talk about overcoming failure. How do you do it? Uh, I'll tell you. You know what? I'll, you learn it in politics, that's for sure. Uh, because you have a great idea and it gets shot down. And, and uh, next thing you know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're in the media. And they said, boy, that was a dumb idea. Yeah. And uh, thank God our media cycles are really fast. <laughs> I, think, I think it comes down to having self-confidence and realizing that um, you can't win them all. But you've got to keep moving forward. And uh, uh, getting back to Mayor Bloomberg, we held the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Miami Beach uh, a few months ago. Big success, record number of mayors came to Miami Beach. And Mayor Bloomberg said, you know, uh, he said I, uh, what he found with people is that even if they didn't agree with him, um, the fact that he believed it, he was authentic, he tried to do what he felt was right. People appreciate that and they, and they really kind of uh, uh, understand it and they, and they, they get it. Um, but I think everyone has failure in their life. And I think you have to pick yourself up and keep going forward. What do you make of the income inequality in this country? It's too much. It's ridiculous. Um, listen, I've been a very successful guy and I've been very fortunate. Um, but when you see the extraordinary, crazy wealth that some of my private equity friends have, uh, this one's worth $10 billion, that one's worth $5 billion, it's gotten to the point where it's, it's too much. And, and, and the reason being I say it is that it's okay to be a billionaire, and it's okay to be amazingly successful. I'm so happy that I was successful that I am successful. But I think it's important to realize that if everybody doesn't feel like they have the opportunity to achieve the American dream, then it's not good for anybody. You know, it's always fun to drive that really beautiful new car you have on the highway. And when the people drive next to you, and they may not be in such a nice car, you want them to look at you and feel like that they have the opportunity someday to get that nice car. Mm -hmm. When they stop believing that and they stop feeling that, that's a problem. That mess with our system. And our system is the American dream. And it should be attainable to everybody. And I, and I just believe that, uh, unfortunately, we've seen too much of a separation. Why do you think that is? I think it has to do with certain policies. I think it has to do with certain irregularities in the market. Uh, and I believe that it's something that we have to figure out a way to, to make sure that everybody can eat, that everybody can have health care. And health care not like that the government should pay for it all. But if you really can't afford it, let's take care of some of these people. Mm -hmm. But the private sector and the government can work together to come up with great solutions. I believe in hybrid solutions with the private sector and the government. Interesting. Tell me about your serious satellite radio program. How did that come about? It's fun. About a year and a half ago, uh, I uh, was uh, in conversations with Sirius XM about doing a show, about interviewing interesting people, and uh, it became just a fun, great hobby. And it's been interviewing wonderful, great people, like I, you do, I know, and uh, uh, this last tour around Florida called A Day in the Sun uh, was great. We just met some of the most amazing Floridians, uh, everyone from somebody that literally like captures pythons with his bare feet and bare hands in the Everglades to a company that still hand rolls cigars in Tampa to Harley Davidson dealerships in Daytona. Uh, so it's been a great experience and it's been allowing me just to, to meet amazing Floridians. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your, your current company. Sure. Uh, Roy, was it Royal Media? Yeah, I sold, I sold all my, my larger companies uh, to a, obviously Louis Vuitton bought my companies and 
because all the all my mom when she was in the company working with me always wanted to know do we get free pocketbooks and purses after that <laughs> did you <laughs> yeah no they, they gave a discount but that was it and uh, and then I, I, years later I restarted my old companies again uh, much smaller with the partnership with Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines and uh, we do the in cabin magazines and in cabin television for uh, Royal Caribbean and celebrity cruises and it's been fun it, thank God it's a lot smaller I have a great executive team and I focused on being mayor yeah. um, if you decide not to run for governor, what would you do? I would just go back and build some great companies and, uh, and continue on with my life because uh, uh, the difference between me and a typical politician is uh, uh, life was good, great before politics, and it'll be even that much better after politics. Would you consider perhaps doing something in Washington? Would that be something that would ever cross your mind? No, not at all. No. Not at all. I love Florida. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I'm more of an executive. Uh, I'm, I don't see myself in any type of legislative position. That's just not who I am. I like, I like, I like, like getting things done. <laughs> I like to get things done. That's it. If you run for governor and you win, what are you going to focus on your first year? Economic opportunities for everybody. I want to bring those amazing companies to Florida. We don't just want $8.10 an hour jobs. We want great companies offering great jobs to Floridians. I want those millennials to stay here. I'm going to focus on business, focus on education, and focus on the environment in the state of Florida. You mentioned millennials quite a few times in this conversation. Um, oftentimes people say, oh, I don't know about the young people in, in today's world and where things are going to end up. What do you think about millennials? I think they're the greatest. I think they're the best. I think they're the smartest generation. And I think that uh, they have so much to offer. And we haven't seen nothing yet for them. They're, they're, they're going to keep coming on. And uh, a lot of the things that we use today were developed by millennials, and that includes Uber. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I heard a college professor who I interviewed on this program, and he did say, he said, I think the top 20% are the smartest and the best I've ever seen. Oh, no question about it. Yeah. And we have millennials working with us. I see them in all types of industries. And, and the key is, how do we keep them in Florida? We do it by creating an ecosystem whether it's transportation, infrastructure, education, environment, and the great companies to come here so they stay in Florida. Well, Mayor, what a pleasure. Thank you. Very, uh, very nice talking to you. Continued success. Thank you, Jeff. Depending on whatever you decide to do, whether you run for governor or whether you continue in the business world, I know you'll probably do a little bit of both, but wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet. Our pleasure. Mayor Philip Levine, he is the mayor of Miami Beach, Florida, and may very well be a candidate for governor of the Sunshine State. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations, as well as on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by Gulf Power, a Southern company. And by viewers like you. Thank you.